Magazine. He's been with Commentary since 1994. He's the senior editor there. Uh, Gabriel Schoenfeld has written for Commentary on a wide range of issues and subjects, including the Vietnam War, issues of terrorism, nuclear proliferation, the Cold War, and certainly issues of anti-Semitism, as well as 20th century German and Russian history. His articles have been published in other leading journals and magazines, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New Republic, and the Atlantic Monthly, um, as well as others. Uh, Gabriel Schoenfeld earned his, his doctorate degree from Harvard University, and as many of you know who studied the issues of contemporary, contemporary issues of anti-Semitism, he wrote, I think, a very important book in 2004 called The Return of Anti-Semitism. And I think, in a way, launched um, the intellectual inquiry into what's happening in the contemporary context on a very important issue. So it's really a privilege to have you here Thank you very much, Charles, for that uh, generous introduction. And it's really a new honor to be here at uh, Yale talking about this important subject. I want to just begin by uh, acknowledging the presence in, in Room of my sister, uh, Miriam DeMeo, and her, hu her husband, Dan DeMeo, who's on the faculty here, and their son, Jonathan, who's a sophomore here. Um, Charles mentioned that I am an editor uh, at Commentary, and I want to uh, use that as a way to begin explaining how I came to, uh, to write a book about anti Semitism, beginning, which I started working on in, uh, in 2002. Um, Commentary is published by the, uh, was at that point, published by the American Jewish Committee. It's housed in the offices of the American Jewish Committee. And as I was working in the offices, in those offices, in that building, uh, over a decade, I observed, um, as time went by, that an ever more stringent set of security measures were being put in place in and around the building. Uh, the uh, windows were coated with a laminated glass that case of a blast in the street would not sh shatter shards on us. Uh, security barriers were placed in the street so that cars could not approach the, vehicle, approach the building. Armed guards and a New York City police officer were at various times stationed in front of the buildings. A device called a man trap that keeps un unauthorized people from coming into the building were put in place. Now, in watching all of this, uh, provoked a question in my mind. What, what is the nature of the threat that people working in the offices of a major American Jewish organization face in this world? And of course, there was a debate going on at that time about um, resurgent anti-Semitism and whether we were witnessing something new. And uh, one voice in that debate was uh, Leon Wieseltier of the New Republic, uh, the literary editor of the New Republic, who dismissed Alarm about uh, researching anti Semitism as what he calls ethnic panic. And I uh, wanted to set out on my own and answer the question what, what, what it is that uh, we were facing in, in New York uh, and indeed around the world. Now, I think it's obvious uh, to anyone who's uh, observing contemporary affairs that there is a research in anti Semitism. And I think it's also obvious that the center of that resurgence is the Islamic world. Uh, in particular, two countries, uh, one Sunni, one Shiite, in the heart of the Islamic world, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. And in both of these uh, countries, one finds uh, an extreme uh, exterminationist uh, brand of anti-Semitism that draws on a variety of, of motifs, uh, draws on indigenous Islamic sources, fuses them with medieval Christian anti-Semitic themes, uh, brings in certain modern Nazi racial ideas, and propagates this blend of very lethal uh, hatred uh, in, uh, internally uh, in its, uh, all of its institutions, in, in its mosques, in its schools, in its textbooks, on, its, on their radio stations of these two countries, on the television stations. I just want to give you, uh, before moving on from this material, to give you a flavor of what the kinds of things that are being uh, that are being put uh, into circulation uh, by these countries. This is a um, an account by the, uh, the Saudi newspaper Al Riyadh, 
of how Jews uh, for the festival of Purim make the pastry we call Hamikasha. And the ingredient for this is not uh, poppy seeds uh, in their telling of it, but something else. And just a brief paragraph that explain that let us examine now how the victim's blood is spilled. For this, a barrel side, a barrel studded, a needle studded barrel is used. This is a kind of barrel about the size of a human body with extremely sharp needles set, set in it on all sides. These needles pierce the victim's body from the moment he is placed in the barrel. These needles do the job, and the victim's blood drips from him slowly. Thus, the, victors, the victim suffers dreadful torment, torment that affords the Jewish vampires great delight as they carefully monitor every detail of the bloodshedding with pleasure and love that are difficult to comprehend. Now, this kind of material was, I mean, in fact, dramatized in a 24-part uh, television docudrama that was broadcast in Egypt and then exported across the uh, Arab world and across the Islamic world, played in Ramadan. And it, it is uh, this kind of very, very limited anti-Semitism is uh, ubiquitous and commonplace in, in, these, in these societies. It appears in the theocracies like Iran and Saudi Arabia, but it also in militancy, uh, also prevalent in militantly secular societies uh, like Syria and Libya, and societies that are at peace with Israel like Jordan and Egypt. The Palestinian Authority has peddled some of it, so does Hamas. Um, and of course, such incitement is uh, one of the prime factors that underpins the phenomenon of suicide bombings, the willingness to die as long as one takes as many as the as many of the evil Jews as possible with one to the grave. Now it's important to note, I think, that um, this kind of uh, this Islamic brand of anti-Semitism is not confined to those countries that are that are near Israel or locked in conflict with Israel, but extends much further afield, thousands of miles away, to countries that have had virtually no contact or no contact at all with Jewish communities. Countries like Malaysia, which have never had a Jewish, which never has had a Jewish population, but whose former prime minister until, what is it, two years ago, Mohammed Mahathir, uh, over the course of his 25 years in power, repeatedly traded on uh, anti-Semitic themes uh, as a tool of his rule, blaming uh, the financier George Soros for, uh, and other and international Jews for manipulating Malaysian, Malaysian currency, publishing tracts like Henry Ford's uh, Inter International Jew uh, for distribution in Malaysia. Similarly, uh, Pakistan, uh, which had a small Jewish community that, that, that largely fled uh, in 1948, um, uh, is a country that uh, by accounts of Western journalists who've been there and some Pakistani intellectuals, where this anti-Semitic thinking is, uh, is rife, where the population, uh, there's widespread belief that the attacks of September 11th were organized by the American Jewish community to draw the United States into a war with, with the Taliban uh, and uh, all sorts of other uh, anti-Semitic ideas. Uh, and of course, some of this is the, is the result of the influence of uh, Saudi Arabia, which has used its uh, oil, oil wealth to finance a uh, dense network of madrasas, of educational institutions in Pakistan, where this kind of material is, is uh, propagated. And of course, we saw um, you know, the most tragic uh, manifestation of this in the, uh, uh, in the case of Daniel Pearl, who, uh, his last word, who was forced to utter his last words before he was beheaded were, uh, my mother is a Jew, my father is a Jew, I am a Jew. That was the last words of his video. Now, Europe would seem to have uh, inoculated itself against this kind of anti-Semitism. World War II, a war against the Jews, led to the total ruin of Western Europe, parts of Eastern Europe, Western Eastern Europe, along with six million Jews, tens of millions of other Europeans, civilians and soldiers, perished in the war that Hitler unleashed against the Jews. 
And this indeed has served to inoculate Europe to a large degree against this kind of a certain kind of anti-Semitism. There is an anti-Semitic right in Europe, but its, its electoral ambitions have not really amounted to much. Uh, the two, I think, the most uh, uh, two exceptions to the rule, perhaps, or maybe they're not exceptions because they, have, they themselves have not gotten very far, are uh, John Marie Le Pen, the head of France's National Front, who in 2002 managed to force a runoff run in the election with Jacques Chirac, uh, which was the high water mark of his career. But he subsequently lost to Chirac uh, in the largest landslide in the, in the French, uh, history of the French, modern French Republic. And his platform, in any case, was more generally xenophobic than anti-Semitic, although it was not certainly free of that or tinge of that. And then, of course, there's, there's in Austria, there's the case of Jörg Haider, the head of Austria's Freedom Party, who comes directly from a man who comes directly from a Nazi milieu. His fortune is based upon uh, lands that he inherited from his parents, which was confiscated from Jewish families in Austria. And in 1999, he managed to win, uh, his party managed to win 30% 30, uh, 30 of the vote in Austria. And the New York Times at the time editorialized that this, where this represented the uh, possibly a wave of the future. Uh, but in fact, the Freedom Party in elections three years after that dropped down to 10%. And uh, it's really remained a rather marginal party. And I think in both instances, what's happened is that these, these xenophobic parties have had their xenophobic message uh, co-opted by more mainstream parties, and they've lost influence. But um, if right-wing anti, this kind of right-wing fascist or Nazi-style anti-Semitism has not been on a tear in Western Europe in the last in the post-war era, then this hardly means that anti-Semitism in Europe is dead. For there are other anti-Semitic traditions that are, that are that are very much in play, and, and the first and the most obvious is uh, the Islamic one. Uh, there's been a profound uh, demographic shift uh, in Europe in the post-war era. If there were uh, a million Muslims in Europe, living in Europe in 1945, today that number has swelled to approximately 20 million. And they represent one of, it's one of the fastest growing uh, populations in Europe, in this you know, world where population rate, birth rates are very low. And I'm aware that I'm making some gross generalizations uh, that cover up some significant variations among European Muslims. We go from country to country and from grouping to grouping. But in general, it is a population that is faring uh, very poorly on every indicator of social and economic success. It's suffering from high rates of unemployment, high rates of illiteracy, high rates of incarceration. It is a profoundly alienated population. It is also a population that has brought with it to, to Europe many of the, uh, the attitudes and the passions and the hatreds that are ubiquitous uh, in the Islamic world. And it's also a population that is still living in Europe, recipient of broadcasting from the Middle East. Some of these very incite, these, in these hateful uh, television broadcasts are beamed directly into France and uh, Italy from uh, places like Lebanon. And one result of this has been a, uh, a, a striking rise in the level of violence uh, directed against the objects of this group's hatred, namely uh, Europe's remaining Jewish population, its institutions, its synagogues, uh, cemeteries, and our individual Jews. And the most you know, dramatic case I think has been in France, where we've seen the most activity of this nature culminating in the, uh, in the torture murder last year of a young French Jew, Ilan Halimi, uh, which seems to have uh, awoken the, uh, the French government uh, to, the, to the nature of the, of the problem at last. And, and there, has been, there has been a concerted effort to try and confront it. But the fact is that uh, it's difficult to be a Jew in France today, that French Jews are emigrating uh, from France to Israel in, in record numbers, that French uh, Jewish parents who uh, are a, typically prided themselves in the past on entering their children to the French public school system uh, are no longer uh, 
able to do that in many cases. The French schools have become too dangerous for their children. And it's a uh, place where the, the chief rabbi of France has warned Jews not to wear attire that identifies them as Jews in public, which is a striking thing to be said in Europe of uh, 2007. Now, if the situation in France has begun to ease, and I, I'm not sure that it really has, uh, Great Britain is now taking center stage. And there are reports just this year that uh, anti-Semitic attacks there increased by 40% in 2006 to the highest levels since uh, records began to be kept in 1984, which is probably, which is almost certainly connected uh, this very sharp rise to the, uh, this past summer's war between uh, Hezbollah and Israel, which typically provokes a rise in violence in, in, in Europe. Now, but, but, but beyond what is happening on the streets and that kind of street violence, um, I think perhaps more important is uh, what is happening among Europe's elites, where another uh, an old uh, anti-Semitic tradition is displaying fresh life. And I have in mind here the anti-Semitism of the left. And in, in post-Holocaust Europe, uh, it is, um, of course, not respectable at all to speak ill of Jews. But a, a, in, in, in progressive circles in Europe, a variety of uh, synonyms are, are uh, employed as a substitute. Uh, among them are the terms, the obvious one being Zionist, slightly less obvious is neoconservative, which are, are used to disguise, uh, which are used to convey undisguised loathing of both uh, Jews and, the Jew and, the, and Israel. At, at universities uh, across Europe, uh, campaigns have been underway to organize boycotts of uh, Israeli academics. Anyone who is a, considered an Israeli citizen is treated as a war criminal by some of these campaigns. And all of these campaigns are premised on the mendacious idea that Israel, the Middle East's only liberal democracy, is the world's worst human rights violator. While those organizing these, these campaigns, these boycott campaigns, maintain near total silence about uh, human right, genuine human rights abuses elsewhere, the ongoing genocide in the Sudan, or unrestrained tyranny in countries like Saudi Arabia and, um, and Iran. Now, in some of this, in some of this uh, left-wing anti, this 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 progressive anti-Semitism, there are fascinating echoes of uh, the anti of the left-wing anti-Semitism of another era. I just want to read a brief quotation from the, the, the French socialist uh, Pierre Proudhon, writing in the mid-19th century, man of the left, who offered his own remarkable solution to the problem posed by the Jews. He said, Proudhon wrote, we should make a provision against that race, which poisons everything by budding in everywhere, without ever merging in with any people should demand its expulsion from France, except for individuals married to French women, abolish the synagogues, allow them to enter no employment, finally proceed with the abolition of this religion. Not for nothing have the Christians called them deicides. The Jew is the enemy of mankind. That race must be sent back to Asia or exterminated. Now, what's astonishing here is not only that Proudhon fully anticipated the solution uh, employed a century later by the Nazis, exterminating the Jews, but also the idea, traceable to the anti-Semitism of the medieval era, that the Jews are the people that poisons everything, the people that poison the well, the people that are responsible for the Black Plague. And this same idea is very much in evidence today. Simon Jenkins, the leading columnist for the, for this, for the London Times, can find no explanation for the war in Iraq other than that Jews, whose first commitment, he says, is to the defense of Israel, have seized the reins of power in Washington and even London. And left-wing magazines in England and in Europe carry cover stories about Zionist cabals, featuring pictures of the Jewish star piercing the US Capitol. It is Jews, once again, who are held responsible for the world's ills in the form of the Jewish state. 
and it is, it is Jews who refuse, as Proudhon had it, to blend in with their neighbors and disappear. Now, particularly striking in this left-wing anti-Semitism is the persistent effort by leading European intellectuals to delegitimize the Jewish state by linking it uh, to the ultimate symbol of evil, Nazi Germany. To be sure, this is not a, uh, entirely a new phenomenon. Uh, back in the, in the early 1980s, Olaf Palm, the Swedish prime minister, uh, a leading figure uh, on the European left, he was president of the Socialist International, uh, accused Israel of locking up the Palestinians on the West Bank just in the way the Nazis locked up Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. That, that caused a huge stir at the time. But what was a shocking novelty in the early 80s uh, is today uh, a commonplace. The Irish poet Tom Paulin has written this poem about a Zionist SS gunmen shooting down Palestinian children. Jose Saramago, the novelist, the Portuguese novelist, in classical anti-Semitic language, uh, says that the Israelis, motivated by the certitude that they are chosen by God, are committing crimes against the Palestinians like those committed by the Nazis at Auschwitz. But of course, all this is a, is a, uh, is a, is a fantasy. There are no uh, gas chambers on the West Bank, and no crematoria, and no genocide is taking place. But the fact is that Jose Saramago is not a uh, crackpot writing for other crackpots. He is a leading man of letters. He is a Nobel laureate in literature. And the fact that he is giving voice to such ideas is a sign of how far this left-wing anti-Semitism has traveled in Europe. It is also a sign of how some of the most progressive figures on the European stage are actually agents of the most reactionary aspects of the European past. What about the US? Um, where do we stand in relation to these patterns? Uh, I would argue that um, they appear here, but in greatly the same patterns appear here, but in greatly attenuated form. As in Europe, the anti-Semitic right uh, in the United States is at a low tide. The 1995 Oklahoma City bombing by Timothy McVeigh discredited uh, the message of all these fringe movements and brought, un brought them all under unprecedented police scrutiny. Groups like the very the Aryan Nation and the militia have been under tremendous pressure, and their memberships are down, and they're, they don't play much of a role, although, of course, any lone crackpot can do a lot of damage. Conservative intellectuals who have flirted with anti Semitism have been drummed out of the, out of the conservative movement, just to name uh, two uh, more prominent ones. Uh, Jude Winiski was a distinguished member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board, uh, but then began to write, uh, not in the journal, but uh, elsewhere, papers in defense of the anti-Semitic pronouncements of, of uh, Louis Farrakhan. And uh, he was let go from the journal, and the next thing one knew, he was uh, really a crackpot writing for a website, uh, and that was the extent of his influence. Uh, Joseph Sobron, who was a columnist for uh, William Buckley's National Review, a leading conservative uh, magazine, also began at some point, I believe, in the uh, 70s, writing a series of truly uh, outrageous anti-Semitic uh, articles, uh, not, in, not in National Review, but elsewhere. And he was uh, forced off of the uh, masthead of, uh, of National Review by, by Bill Buckley, and is now uh, I've seen consorting with the uh, folks at the Institute for Historical Review, which is a, a, a uh, Holocaust denial outfit operating in California. So he has also been moved to the far margins. When various fundamentalist Christian leaders, like Pat Robertson, have given voice to anti-Semitic ideas, they have come in for vociferous criticism from across the spectrum. Anti-Semitic politicians on the right have not gotten very far at all. David Duke in 1991, perhaps the leading exception, he managed to get 30% of the vote in a Louisiana gubernatorial election. But it's been downhill for him ever since. 
He had a fraud conviction, served time in prison, and he has served his service most recently, not surprisingly, at the Holocaust Denial Convention in Tehran of uh, late last year. Pat Buchanan, who has flirted with anti-Semitism repeatedly over the years, uh, his, his various presidential runs amounted to nothing on both the Republican line and the populist line. And running in, 19, in 2000 as a populist uh, and not really making much of his anti-Semitic ideas along the way, incidentally, he did not prove to be very popular. He received 0.04% of the popular vote. So if you write this, uh, right-wing anti-Semitism is not flourishing, the other traditions are doing uh, slightly better. Uh, as in Europe, we have uh, our own indigenous and Islamic anti-Semitism. We have some two to four million Muslims in the US and the United States. Perhaps three quarters of them are immigrants. This is a population that is much better integrated into American life than is the case in Europe and much more prosperous and uh, thriving. But still, uh, there are elements in this population that are uh, publishing blatantly anti-Semitic material, the Arab Voice, one of their major newspapers, has uh, published, republished protocols of the elders of Zion. Uh, there, there, there's ubiquitous articles and, and, and books in, in Islamic bookstores, uh, Arabic language bookstores, in, in which the thesis is put forward that Jews are responsible for the, or Israel is responsible for the attacks of September 11, and so forth. And this uh, Islamic population, like Jewish population, like the Christian population in this country, has organized its own system of day schools and Sunday schools to uh, convey their faith to their children. And according to reporting by the New York Times and the Washington Post, many of the textbooks you know, in use in these schools, where there's some 30,000, 40,000 kids being exposed to this material, are, are textbooks which have been imported from Saudi Arabia and which teach things that, like that Jews are the sons of monkeys and apes, that Jews worship mon money, and other standard, not so standard, anti-Semitic tropes. Now, unlike in Europe, we also have a, uh, a black Muslim population with very special circumstances, including the fact that some 300,000 to 400,000 uh, black Muslims in this country are incarcerated in prisons. And these inmates, like other inmates have religious needs that uh, must be catered to. And in one institution after another, it turns out, the authorities have, 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 have turned to Saudi-trained imams to administer uh, religious counseling in, in the prisons. So we have a situation where um, a sector of American society that is uh, most prone to violence is being indoctrinated in some of the most uh, fun, in the <coughs> fundamental brand of Islam including in some instances directly its anti-Semitic teachings. And actually, as, as an editor of commentary, I've received letters from prisoners, Jewish prisoners, uh, just complaining about the situation in their prisoners over the years. But the sum total of all of these um, trends is that we've seen, we've seen an upsurge uh, in violence against Jews committed by Muslims. Um, if in the past uh, that kind of violence, synagogue desecration, cemetery desecration was uh, carried out largely by skinheads, increasingly it's carried out by Muslim youth. But uh, apart from that, uh, that kind of low-level violence, we've also had a number of spectacular, more spectacular attacks, which I think bear, bear, bear mention. Uh, there was, just to mention before, uh, on the Brooklyn Bridge in 1994, a, uh, a Lebanese Muslim opened fire on a van carrying Hasidic young people uh, and killed one. There was a 1997 attack on the top floor of the Empire State Building by a Palestinian gunman who killed one person. He said in his confession that his aim was to kill as many Jews as possible. There was a 2002 attack by an Egyptian immigrant on the LL ticket counter in Los Angeles. And just last year, of course, in Seattle, a uh, US-born Muslim uh, stormed the Seattle Jewish Center and uh, killed one woman. And, and you shot five others. So the security doors around my building are there for, are, are definitely there for a reason. Uh, that's one of them. Now, as in Europe, the United States has its own, uh, also has its own left-wing anti-Semitism. Now, there's, I would argue there's been a certain measure of, uh, 
recent trend is that there's been a certain measure of tolerance within the Democratic Party for candidates who have openly expressed anti-Semitic ideas. And the most significant case, of course, is um, that of the Reverend Al Sharpton, who in the 1991 Crown Heights riots openly fanned the embers of anti-Semitism by uh, declaiming against diamond merchants from Tel Aviv who were robbing the black community. He subsequently led a boycott of a Jewish-owned store in Harlem, Freddy's, where there was a lot of incitement, including incitement to burn it down. That incitement didn't come from him. But the store did indeed burn down, killing eight employees. Now, the media and the leading Democrats who have the court of his support uh, make absolutely no mention of, mention of this. He participates in the debates as an equal. He's, in fact, he is the one who is allowed to lecture other candidates on race relations. And uh, his whole history of anti-Semitic pronouncements has become a taboo subject uh, in, in, the part, in the party and uh, in the media itself. Now, as in Europe, um, much of this new left, this left-wing anti-Semitism can also be found in universities. Uh, we saw this particularly uh, when the Second Intifada was at its height, that there were demonstrations on campuses across the country in which uh, placards were held up, in which the Jewish star was equated with the uh, with, the, with the Nazi swastika, uh, placards bearing pictures of dead babies labeled slaughtered according to kosher rights were uh, uh, visible. But beyond these, you know, again, street-level activities, uh, there have been activity in the elite faculties as well, including in the Ivy League faculties, where there has been a movement somewhat now in the banks to uh, single out Israel as the world's most uh, as the world's worst human rights violator, and is the only country that uh, institutions like Yale, MIT, Harvard should divest their stocks from. Their stocks from. Uh, and as I say, this campaign is, I think it's not done all that well. It's, uh, it's, I don't hear that much about it right now, but the universities uh, have now given birth to another controversy uh, in which two uh, leading political scientists, uh, John Mearsheimer of the University of Chicago and uh, Stephen Wall of the <coughs> Kennedy School at Harvard, have published this uh, paper about uh, the, the, uh, the undue influence of the Israel lobby. But uh, the way they define that is essentially American Jewry as a whole. And the paper itself uh, raises the question or directly suggests that American Jews have uh, dual loyalties, which is a time-honored anti-Semitic canard, and which, in fact, it does not mean dual loyalties at all, but actually means single loyalties, loyalty to their fellow Jews ahead of loyalty to the United States. And this is an argument that they've made at great length with a great many footnotes, but uh, they are wrapping an old uh, anti-Semitic idea in, in scholarly garb. Now, we are trying to say the world um, would, would strenuously deny that there's anything anti-Semitic about their paper. Indeed, uh, they insist that they themselves are philo-Semitic, as they told interviewers in, uh, in, in, in England. Which, which uh, brings me to, to uh, two concluding points that I, that I would like to make. Uh, which is, first, is that just as, there's, just as there's something called Holocaust denial, there's something called anti-Semitism denial, which is a refusal to call things by their proper names. Uh, I'll just give a few instances uh, I encountered in the course of writing my book. There was a, there was a, uh, there was a riot in, Uc in Ukraine in which uh, youth were chanting, death to the kikes in the street. And uh, the following day, the mayor of Kiev had a uh, press conference. He was asked by the journalist, by West Virginia, several journalists about this, and he explained that it was not anti-Semitism, it was just hooliganism. And Jacques Chirac, president of France, at one point he said, there's no anti-Semitism and no anti-Semites in France. He subsequently adopted a more a less benign point of view. And I had my own peculiar encounter with this while I, while I was researching the book. I came across a, a, a quotation from a student newspaper at Rutgers uh, that I wanted to track down and authenticate. Uh, it, said, it said something like, uh, it said exactly like, die, Jew, die, 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 build yourself an oven, die. And I called the faculty member at Rutgers who was responsible for this publication. I didn't have an original copy. I'd just seen it quoted somewhere. And I wanted her to tell me whether it, in fact, appeared and also what she could tell me about it. And she did, she did um, confirm that it appeared. And I, she said, but I, she asked me what I was 
confusing it for me, so I'm writing a book about anti-Semitism, and she said, oh, Mr. Schoenfeld, you don't understand. That's not anti-Semitism. That's just students blowing off steam. So um, I think there's a refusal in some quarters to face uh, exactly where we are. The, the dangers that are on the horizon are, are very uh, various, and I think we should, it's important not to exaggerate them and to analyze each of them according to its own situation. Uh, but uh, I don't think that it's fair uh, that to say that the Jewish world, as Leon Riedeltier would have it, uh, is in, uh, in a state of ethnic panic. And indeed, given the fact that uh, there is a regime, the Iranian regime, which is imbued with uh, anti-Semitic hatred, whose president openly denies the Holocaust, and whose president openly speaks of annihilating the Jewish state, wiping it from the map. And it's a regime that is engaged in terrorism against the Jewish world, blowing up the uh, Jewish cultural center in Argentina uh, and the Israeli embassy there in the 1990s. And a regime now intent on acquiring nuclear weapons, and according to best intelligence estimates, is two or three years away from actually acquiring such weapons, comparisons in some respects to the dangers faced by the Jews in the 1930s are not completely out of order. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So Dr. Schoenfeld has agreed to take the question. Uh, Specifically, early on in your talk, you mentioned about the anti-Semitism in the Muslim world uh, and the publications there and the television shows. So I wanted to know about two things. One, what can be done to combat it in the Muslim world? And two, to what extent is it bad faith versus if everywhere you look, there are publications of the protocols of the elder of Zion, people come to believe, oh, well, it must be true. So to what extent is it driven by bad faith, you think, versus ignorance or misinformation? I think it's largely not driven by bad faith, but is taken on a life of its own and accepted as truth by uh, large segments of the population. Now, I, I, when it goes into uh, intellectual circles, things become more murky. But I think it's not an accident that the leading Egyptian journalist, Mohamed Haikal, who wrote, I mean, some of the best histories of, um, let's say, the Young Kippur War uh, from, the, from the Arab side. A you know, reputable story of a man who moves in uh, comfortably in European capitals, uh, has endorsed uh, the works of David Irving and the British Holocaust denier. And, said, and, and so there's, I think there's, a, uh, I don't know if that's bad faith or not, but uh, it, it's, it's a fact that this is, these beliefs are top to bottom, and not just at the grassroots, they're in the elite, uh, and uh, they're, uh, as for combating them, uh, that's a very uh, difficult problem, uh, apart from uh, regime change. Uh, what measures short of regime change uh, can be employed? Uh, there is some Western broadcasting into some of these societies, which I think can play an important role. There are institutions like memory, that uh, Hugo I believe you spoke here, uh, go, go about just assembling some of the more extreme things in the press and distributing them, and I think calling attention to them <coughs> can have some, is a very, very necessary first step in combating them. But I, I myself do not have a, a, a program uh, beyond that uh, for, for dealing with this. And so, Alon, and then you, and if you, if you sort of indicate to me, I'll put this down on this. Yeah, so, uh, there is some kind of a paradox, uh, maybe you can feel it in um, the left traditionally was very much uh, trying to turn on civil rights. Again, generally it's the same thing. But how do you speak up here? Yes, I said the general notion is that the left is uh, very much uh, aware of uh, civil rights. Uh, how does it fit with this paradox of uh, left uh, supporting anti-Semitism if one uh, can consider uh, you know, uh, anti-Semitism as an issue of civil rights? Well, it's a very good question. And I, I, just, I guess the way I would answer it is that the left and liberal and liberalism are 
composed of many strands of thought. And uh, there are, some of them are very much in contradiction with one another. And there is, of course, a liberal, a true liberal strand on the left that believes in civil rights and defends civil rights and advocates civil rights. But there are other strands that go back into the Enlightenment. You have know, Voltaire, who, who, in his anti-clericalism, became extremely anti-Judaic, looking at Judaism as the trunk, as the tree trunk from which Christianity, which he hated, had grown. And he wanted to extirpate both. And there's a, you know, this gave voice to the, the whole stream of anti-Semitic thought in the 19th century. And you have quotations like that from Proudhon, but you can go through the works of Marx, himself a Jew, of course. You can find these, in the socialist tradition, a great deal of, of uh, anti-Semitic hatred. So these, and these schools exist in tension with each other and uh, are manifest today on the left by people who are not thinking in these terms, but, but are somehow echoing uh, these older voices. One of the uh, kind of touchier issues, I think, surrounding anti-Semitism today is, and you, you, you touched on it briefly, especially with uh, Walter Mearsheimer, um, the issue of can one equate or how, how much one can equate anti-Zionism with, or anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Um, and, and this, I think, also recently has, has become a very hot issue with to what extent the left in the American Jewish community that's very critical of Israel is almost uh, anti-Semitic or, or self-hating. So could you talk a little bit about, about is there a distinction? If there is, what is? What well, is I, I think we would really depends here what we're, what, how we redefine anti-Zionism. Anti-Zionism is the belief that there should be no Jewish state in the Middle East. I, I would have to call that anti-Semitic, because it, what are practical consequences of that would be to lead to the death of the Jewish population of Israel. I mean, where are they uh, going to go? And what, are they going to live under the regime of Hezbollah or Hamas? Or that, that seems to me uh, like fairly simple. I think matters get much more murky when we're talking about criticism of what Israel does in particular instances. And some of those criticisms can be anti-Semitic, some can't be. I'll just give an example of, um, of the kind of criticism that is that I would regard as anti-Semitic. When, for example, in 19, was it 1994, and this hotel was blown up uh, in, in Netanya, and Israel launched an incursion to Janine, refugee camp, to try and apprehend the uh, perpetrators, you know, all sorts of people were condemning Israel for, for the crime of genocide. And this, I think this kind of extreme exaggeration, I mean, there were, I think, a total of 50 uh, people, uh, Palestinians, most of them were armed gunmen, died in that, in that gun battle. To call that genocide, I think, is, a, is to, to really misuse language and then to raise the question of why you're misusing language. But uh, to, I think, to raise objections to where the Israel puts its security barrier, all sorts of other questions are not necessarily motivated by bad faith or and could be, and be perfectly legitimate. But but I think one has to go on a case by case basis. It's a, it's not a there's no bright line. Um, I, I have two questions, Gabriel. Um, one is where are you in the pantheon of Jew haters or critics of Israel? Uh, would you put Jimmy Carter? <laughs> Secondly, um, I'm from Canada. Uh, we believe in freedom of speech, but we also believe in freedom from speech, which means we have some pretty stringent anti-hate laws. And given the extent of hate on, on the internet, which I think culminated in the attack on Elie Wiesel last week by uh, one of these right-wing guys that, that also foment anti-Semitism, which he claimed to have picked up on the internet, um, what recommendations, uh, as an American, I understand how sensitive you are about the First Amendment, um, would you make about use of media, particularly the internet, and fomenting violence against a specific group? Um, both uh, excellent questions. Jimmy Carter uh, is an interesting case, and he just published this very controversial book, which we all have been hearing about, and he's both aggrandized. Uh, and there's some things in that book that really make you wonder about, uh, you know, where he fits in the anti-Semitic tradition. He criticizes Israel, Israelis for not being religious and for 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 for, and for desecrating Christian sites or not behaving properly toward Christians. And there's some Christian motifs in his anti-Semitic, and I think it, arguably anti-Semitism the way he 
this kind of double standard that he refuses to criticize any act of Palestinian terrorism in that book, but hammers Israel for all sorts of, of things and raises questions about his motives in doing that. But um, I, I don't really, I can't go deeper into his psyche than that. And I haven't, I haven't read his book, so I, I'm just relying on reviews, including an excellent one that uh, we published in the uh, February issue of Commentary. Uh, as far as the uh, hate crime laws and controlling the internet, uh, I, I really don't see a possibility for that here in this country. Uh, I, I, per I personally am not uh, opposed to when Austria locks up a Holocaust denier like David Irving, is, he was locked up for three years. That, that doesn't trouble me. I don't think that our, we, should, we need to export our First Amendment around the world to situations where uh, history is very different and much more fraught. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I'm basically a, uh, a liberal on this issue. I think that uh, speech should be answered by speech. Uh, violence and incitement to violence are, are a matter, and there, uh, I mean, it's direct incitement there. And otherwise, that do allow for uh, intervention. But, is it? My question is, why hasn't the uh, American phenomenon of pushing both liberal and conservative anti-Semites to the fringes of uh, political and academic spheres, why hasn't that been successful or been mirrored in Western Europe? Well, I mean, the histories are just so different. And the soil in Europe is so much more fertile for this kind of thing. The United States has really never been any place where anti-Semitism has enjoyed much popularity. I mean, there's some exceptions in some exceptional periods. but. We're, uh, we're as, as, you know, a melting pot. There are other groups that have been beneath the Jews in our history. Of course, American blacks uh, mm -hmm. occupy a space that's far below them. But in the 19th century, you had Catholics and Italians who were the objects of prejudice. So we're, the Jews are not are, are not at the bottom. And well, in, 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 in Europe, for all sorts of historical reasons, that, you know, many many bottoms have been, been written about. Uh, they are a uh, been a targeted uh, minority and uh, remain so, even though they've largely been been uh, destroyed. Yeah, and also two two uh, questions for you. Pakistan is very complicated because here you've got Musharraf who met with Americans in the Congress and encouraged uh, a group of American Pakistanis to go to Israel, and they did and report back to them. Uh, and at the same time, I have I don't remember hearing Mushar cry out when Daniel Pearl was murdered, um, nor any changes in the textbooks there and things like that. So I, I, I wonder if you had gone any deeper into the issues in Pakistan. And the second question is in Connecticut is facing right now is the uh, University of Connecticut has traveled to Dubai and has been talking to about a branch campus, and because we're speaking out that maybe that's not such a good idea, they're putting it on hold right now. On the other hand, uh, Abe Foxman is going to Dubai, the Conference of Presidents of the Organization is going to Dubai, and Shimon Peres, not too long ago, was next door for the United Arab Emirates. So I guess the question is, is have we seen anti-Semitism in those areas? Possibility of some moderation there. Uh, the politics might actually be a little more open. Uh, I don't have I don't have really much more additional insight into the situation in Pakistan. One caveat that I have uh, one of my three daughters, uh, all of them in the past attended uh, public schools in New York with large Pakistani populations. And all of which my children have reported various episodes, blatantly anti Semitic pronouncements by fellow students and uh, teacher and parents of those students. So I think you know this is just a very core immigrant community, but they, these ideas are, are prevalent, uh, are quite prevalent. It's not just uh, media reports. I, I've seen this with my own, I've heard this with my own ears from my children. Uh, the Gulf the Gulf states, I mean they're they're small and I think they're you know they're, they're in various ways they're easier states to modernize. They have the resources and uh, you know, I think there is more. I mean, there is more hope for them that they were going to move away from, from these radical ideas. They have, they have a strong interest in combating uh, Islamic terrorism, which, uh, which uh, 
thrives on this kind of hatred, in fact, is organized around it. So uh, I think I'm, I don't know the specifics of what your school is, is organizing, but uh, I, I'm not closing all doors. And I think there has to be a, a, a process of, of influence at work uh, in dealing with these countries. Uh, okay. I wonder if you would agree that the uh, rise of anti-Semitism is highly correlated with the lower standing in many people's eyes of Israel's behavior. I agree with that. I wonder if you would think the US, U.S. situation first. If the fact that um, the Jewish leadership in the United States, I'm not going to go with this, America, and Iran, and Iran, but the Jewish leadership seems to be unwilling to decide when should support what Israel is doing, when it should not support. It's just it itself. Sometimes they do good things, sometimes not so good things. We all agree on that. But the, the Jewish leadership doesn't, doesn't differentiate. The word black and white is almost like Bush saying either for us or against us. That word is not like that. The word is gray, not black and white. The question I have is, in Israel, people do object to certain things that Israel is doing, others do not object. But in the U.S., you don't get that in the leadership. And I think that's what leads to the kind of anti-Jewish feeling among many people that we are, in fact, monolithically in, in favor of Israel, no matter what they do. Well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, uh, I'm not sure how true that picture is. There's some elements of truth in it, but I, having, having, uh, ha having, uh, we're closely with people in a major Jewish organization. I'm not affiliated with that organization, but I've seen them up close. Uh, I, I don't think that they, they follow every twist and turn of Israeli politics faithfully. And that they, they sometimes they distance themselves from it. Sometimes they choose to support Israel more heavily on one issue, and sometimes they just remain silent. They don't, I think, like to be, it's fair to say, they like to be in a position of criticizing Israel. Uh, that's not what they see their role as, as, as doing, but uh, I don't think they, they don't defend everything Israel does uh, so interesting. I, I don't think in the final analysis that that's that what, what the, Israel, the Jewish American organizations do or don't do is what's promoting this anti-Semitism. I think it's a, I see it much more as a, uh, a rational phenomenon that has roots in uh, all sorts of uh, resentments and uh, hatreds that, that uh, are not susceptible to, uh, to change. But I, I also think that we are, the first part of your question is, 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 is relevant and that Israel's when Israel was much stronger and uh, unquestioned, had unquestioned superiority in the Middle East, when it was after the say the '67 war, uh, we didn't see very much of this. It was uh, it was really after '73, uh, and then when Israel suffered its first major defeat, that we began to see uh, a great deal more sympathy on the left and other sectors for uh, Israel's critics, and, and including some of the more radical ones. You see it only as a military superiority? Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, entire, it, it's entire sense of Iran is also eroded. It's not, uh, I don't think, I think it's become, it's, it's not a fashionable country to support. It's become deeply unfashionable uh, for lots of reasons. And now, of course, it's, you know, its leadership is in kind of unbelievable malaise uh, that that can't help. Uh, but I don't, I don't see this really as, in the end, as a, a result of what anything Israel does or doesn't do. I mean, this is these are. I think it's a, it's, it's a factor, but it's not the decisive factor. I just wanted to uh, answer what I what I think I heard about the civil rights, the liberal issue about why uh, people against Israel. So, well, one of the things people say, and I'm, I'm not speaking for myself is that the Palestinians have been you know, locked up or whatever, all the kinds of things, which all have some truth, but not, you know, I first of all, the Israelis are responsible. But that's the kind of thing I've heard about people who feel that Israel is, you know, violated. Right, well, I think that's rights. clearly, yes, I mean, that's clearly. And, and you didn't yes. answer, you had another answer. I had another answer, but I think your answer is. Maybe is, superficial. Well, it's, it's a, uh, it seems battle as well. I just uh, didn't go in that direction for whatever reason. Since you ventured into the area of Muslim terrorism, I'd like to ask you um, the, the most effective terrorism that the Muslims, uh, Palestinians used against the uh, Israelis were, of course, the suicide bombers. And there was no criticism of that. Now they have extended that technique 
to blowing up each other uh, with the uh, destruction of the uh, Shiite uh, the Golden Dome, blowing up Shiites, blowing up Sunnis, and Sunnis blowing up Shiites, Arabs, uh, uh, Muslim Arabs uh, destroying black Muslims in Dafar and Chad, uh, and the, kind of the, the absence of any criticism by the clerics of Islam uh, and the intellectuals of Islam. Uh, I understand why they didn't care when Jews were blown up, but what's, what's the sign of orthology? Well, I mean, the, the prevalence of anti-Semitism is, like, is a you know, classic indicator of a very sick society. Yes. And so it's not surprising that that sickness is spread not only and the victims of that sickness and not only Jews in the, in the Arab world and the Islamic world generally, there's so few Jews left that these the six societies are turning on themselves and each other and raging war against each other, and, uh, which is what we're seeing now in the really open Sunni Shiite split that's dividing the Middle East, which holds some interesting opportunities for Israel uh, in a strategic way, possible because of alliances, in fact, against. Shiites and some of the Sunni regimes that have been talked about in work. Uh, but uh, as you say, the clerics are not likely to be uh, making criticisms of uh, either side uh, without fear of consequences. It's a very violent world where people are abducted, tortured, and killed. So uh, it's, it's risky to raise one's voice against uh, many things in these, in these tyrannical societies. Uh, yeah, I guess I found your account of the rights uh, renunciation of anti-Semitic elements a little bit uh, un unconvincing. And, I, and I'm thinking, um, you know, somebody like Pat Buchanan has sort of received the sister soldier treatment from the right. There are a lot of people who didn't get the memo, like MSNBC and his 50,000 subscribers to his magazine and... Uh, or read, hey. reading books or whoever publishes his, um, his, sorry, his books. Uh, and, you know, just to compare him with somebody like uh, Al Sharpton, I, I would say they're, they're equally corrosive and divisive figures, but I'd also say they occupy equally sort of unmarginalized or not marginalized enough kind of positions. If you look at their electoral success, I think Patrick Hinn did it a heck of a lot better uh, in 1992 than. Al Sharpton ever did max that about 15% in South Carolina. Uh, so, I mean, if you're using that as a rubric. So, I just, I just thought your, your account of the right was just a little bit Pollyannish. And I think, kind of long term, I mean, isn't, uh, isn't maybe the, the, the long term threat from the right still more, the more dangerous? Uh, I, 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 well, first of all, I, what your, all your remarks about what I said seem on target. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, I, I really was talking about the electoral prospects of. Buchanan, but I, I do agree with you that he's not been marginalized. He's accepted in these mainstream places. Certainly not accepted in the Republican Party, though, uh, because he's uh, left the party and he's a liability for the party. Uh, but he is, I mean, he is a part of mainstream media culture. Uh, I just don't see the evidence that would point to the, to the right being the long-term danger in this country for, for, for anti-Semitic movement. I see. To the extent that I see trouble, I see it uh, coming from the Islamic world and from uh, from the left. And I, I, I have a chapter in verse. Uh, there, I, there are, I, I think you know, Walt and Mearsheimer represent an interesting new twist because they're really they're not on the left. They're really centrist, realist type. So it's a kind of uh, emergence of this uh, kind of dangerous current uh, right in the very center of the establishment. Uh, I don't think that's the, I don't know if you call that the right or not, but uh, it seems to me just dead center. To what extent do you think anti-Semitism in the Arab world or in the Middle East in general, the Islamic world, is sort of a function of resurgence in pan-Arabism, maybe as an attempt to sort of unite what are currently divided forces? Well, I think anti-Semitism plays a role that is something like that. I mean, it, it's a very convenient message for regimes that have a lot to answer for, regimes that have really failed their people and have not. I mean, if you read the Arab Human Development Report, the success of Arab Human Development Reports, these are documents produced by the United Nations, by Arab intellectuals <coughs> that appraise Arab societies and compare them to other societies. I mean, these are really societies in horrific condition. 
and uh, I mean, low rates of, rates of illiteracy. I, mean, I think the combined Arab, combined Arab GDP, uh, including petroleum, is less than the annual GDP of Spain, one European country. These are countries that are not doing well, and uh, anti-Semitism plays a vital role in pointing to uh, a place where you can point to blame for the ills of these societies. And Israel plays a vital role as well. And fomenting hatred of Jews, of Israel, of the West, of Christians as well, uh, is, is that, I think, uh, that's the answer to your question. In recent decades, we've seen strong uh, philo-Semitic sentiments and pro-Zionist sentiments coming from evangelical Christians, perhaps driven by the <coughs> faith in, in the Bible. Is there anything like that going on in Europe? Not that I'm aware of. Not at all. I really don't, I don't know. I mean, I think I mean, it would be, would be right to point out that, um, that the Catholic Church uh, in Europe and generally around the world has made huge strides in trying to reconcile with Judaism and Jews in Israel over the last 20 years. <coughs> years. It's not, it doesn't have the influence it does that uh, in Europe it's in such secular, in secular societies, but to the extent it has influence, it has uh, made you know, very dramatic progress in its understanding of Judaism and its renunciation of its own anti Semitic teachings and in establishing uh, better relations with Israel. So there is a, a kind of counterpart, I suppose. Will? Um, uh, so, so far, uh, thank you very much for your comments today. And uh, I really uh, agree with basically everything I've heard you say. But nonetheless, I feel like there's something missing still. And, uh, We've heard a lot of the historical, political roots of anti-Semitism and the different strains, left and right, Islamic and secular. But I think there's something to be said for the dispossession of the Palestinians in the 20th century, and that this is a cause of much of the resentment. Uh, the, you know, the, the creation of the State of Israel was by force of arms. Uh, the, the Arabs were not represented when uh, Israel was declared. And the Arab states today, supposedly, will make peace. They have agreed to a lot of the things, uh, you know, the UN resolutions, and basically the Camp David framework for peace. And I wonder if, uh, you know, you could address that at all. Did, uh, well, I, 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 I'll try to. I, I think uh, there's some truth to that, that, uh, that the plight of the Palestinians has, uh, and, the, and the territorial conflict that provoked by Israel's creation undoubtedly has a dimension that is free from all these other Things, but it's very tangled in, and it's very hard to disentangle what it is. But I would also point out that many of these currents preceded the formation of the State of Israel, that the uh, Arab states were aligned with Nazi Germany, and that the, during the war that the Iraq was, and that there were the, uh, the, the Mufti in Jerusalem, and that these Nazi uh, racialist anti-Semitism was very prevalent in the Arab world prior to the, state, the establishment of the State of Israel, that these ideas um, were cultivated before and we're growing long before Israel uh, was attacked in 1967 and, or, and came into possession of uh, the West Bank and, and Gaza. And uh, that it's, it's uh, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't, I don't agree with that uh, the Arab states at this point are, are uh, willing and ready to make peace with Israel in terms of all the Arab states represent in the UN. And in addition to that, Larger number of Jews were dispossessed in our countries. Then the Palestinian Arabs were dispossessed from their places in the land of Israel. Now, this is not what I'm going to say, but it ties in. In light of what you said, that essentially, our anti Semitism is state supported and many times organized. What is the sense of, of let's say, the uh, future 
uh, value of peace negotiations on these grounds? Is it, is it really sincere attempt by, or effort by, Arab, by the Arab state or uh, element? Or is it just an exercise in gaining a better position for the future? It, as a process of eliminating <coughs> the Jews and the eventually the second year. Well, I, I, I think the best case study here really in Egypt, which a uh, society that um, they said the Camp David Accords have been in existence now for how long? Uh, since 1979, uh, and basically held, despite the fact that Egypt remains a society that where there's a great deal of, uh, of state supported anti Semitism, and uh, largely because uh, I think it's in Egypt's interest uh, not to wage war uh, against Israel. It has other strategic issues in the, in the region. Uh, those may change. I think that the, you know, the, the great danger in dealing with any autocracy, any, especially one that peddles uh, a hateful ideology like this, is that they're unstable, that they could be toppled tomorrow, that agreements are, are ultimately just pieces of paper. And Israel, uh, or any state trying to enter peace negotiations with such a state, has to take into account their, their instability and their fundamental nature and the, and the attitudes expressed by uh, the prevalence of the population. I think so. You, you, a statesman has to take, take those things into account. Israel, I think, is cognizant of what developments are in Israel, in Egypt, and in Jordan, for that matter, too. But, but uh, it sees it as its interest to, to uh, maintain a state of peace with these countries, and has done so successfully. I don't negate what you said, but I'm trying to get your assessment as to What's the value of this? Well, they've kept Israel has been. I mean, in these cases, is it temporary or is it long lasting? Lasting. Well, it's it's why I'm not a prophet. So uh, uh, I, I, one sees, you know, erosion and uh, and the way the treaties are. Uh, I mean, some of the language that the Egyptians use and ups and downs in the relationship. But I, I think there's, I, I think that the, there's a, these seeking treaties with your peace treaties with your adversaries is a good thing. Uh, unquestionably, and uh, I think, but it has to be done in a clear-eyed way. It's just signing a piece of paper is not adequate. There has to be verifiable uh, disarmament and uh, genuine peace, rather than uh, cold peace, ultimately, for, for real peace to arrive in the region. Yes, I want to thank you and ask you, do you see the need for a new Jewish organization whose mission it would be to combat anti-Semitism all over the world, 24 hours a day, to reply to all these things that happen, to educate and so forth. I don't see an organization that's doing that now on behalf of the Jews. You know, I, I think there, that, that might be a, a useful thing. I mean, there, we, there is an organization that really extensively has that as its mission, which is the Anti-Defamation League. But I think uh, under a Foxman, I, I think uh, a critic, not of everything they've done, but I feel that they've been quite slow uh, in recognizing some of the challenges that the Jewish world faces, and that they've been much more oriented traditionally towards the threat from the right. Foxman himself is a refugee from from, uh, from Poland, and more concerned about the, 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 the right wing side side of this equation, which is fair enough, but uh, slow to recognize some of the other developments. And so, whether a new organization is needed or a new leadership of the old organization. I don't have the answer, but I, I, I think that these questions demand urgent attention, either require urgent attention. Thank you. So this will be the last question. Is there anybody else? Uh, you, you painted a very we'll bleak picture concerning Iran. A very fighting picture, actually. And I just wonder, do you know anything about the opposition that used to be there that was a very thriving opposition? Think about well, uh, there is a thrive, there is still a thriving opposition in Iran. In fact, it's not just an opposition; there's actually open conflict in different portions of the country. The Persians are only, I think, 50 percent of the population. There are these Kurds, these other minority groups that are really loggerheads. So, with the regime, so there's this ethnic fracturing. What's more, I, mean, it's, I think it's well. I'm very alarmed about developments in Iran. No, couldn't be given what announcements of the president, uh, it's not clear that the analogy to the 1930s works with him. His position is not nearly as secure as St. Hitler's. He's just, had, just suffered defeat in his local elections. There's a lot of turmoil and ferment inside of Iran. 
question in my mind is whether that turmoil and ferment is going to lead to the kind of fundamental change that I hope Iran sees before or after it acquires nuclear weapons. And I think we really can't wait around. Israel and the United States should not wait around to find out the answer. So we'll take the last, the last oh, question. Oh, I just had one comment to make regarding the uh, two intellectual uh, professors who feel that the um, Jews have one position or one political position. And I suggest that um, they study the recent senatorial uh, campaign in um, Connecticut. I think that that really reflects some sincere and serious divisions in uh, political points of view. Thank you. Just one brief announcement. Uh, next week, Basam Tibi from the University of Hamburg will be speaking here on the radical issues of radical Islam. We'll be in this room at 4.15 next week. And on behalf of everybody here, I really have to thank you for our wonderful work.